Hello, I'm Ben Wattenberg. As the late historian Richard Weaver once wrote in his book, Ideas Have Consequences, Ideas Have Consequences. After much deliberation, the editorial board of Think Tank has decided that the most consequential ideas of 1995, the envelope, please, were shame, the anxious class, devolution, and the rethinking of race. Joining us to sort through these four ideas are Judge Robert Bork of the American Enterprise Institute and author of the forthcoming book, Slouching Toward Gomorrah, Modern Liberalism and American Decline. Jody Allen, editor of the Washington Post Outlook section, which makes her one of America's prominent intellectual trend spotters. James Pinkerton, a lecturer in political management at George Washington University and author of What Comes Next, The End of Big Government and the New Paradigm Ahead, and Yvonne Scruggs, director of the Urban Policy Institute at the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies. The topic before this house, 1995, The Year in Ideas, this week on Think Tank. What were the most significant ideas in 1995? First, shame made a big comeback this year, and some say not a minute too soon. This idea was stressed repeatedly by prominent political scientists and historians like James Q. Wilson and Gertrude Himmelfarb. Presidential candidate Robert Dole put some specifics to it. The mainstreaming of devancy must come to an end. But it will only stop when the leaders of the entertainment industry recognize and shoulder their responsibility. Those who cultivate moral confusion for profit should understand this. We will name their names and shame them as they deserve to be shamed. Bob Bork, you are writing a book called Slouching Toward Gamora. Th that uh, relates to this concept of shame, I assume? It relates to the concept of a civilization or a culture sliding downhill. And I think all the talk this year about shame, about stigma, about the comeback that Satan is making, is a recognition that something has gone badly wrong. Of course, to recognize that something has gone badly wrong is not the same as to rectify it. So whether the talk about shame will, in fact, have any reforming effect or not, I don't know. Probably the most significant thing is the possibility that we are witnessing a religious reawakening in this country. And if so, that may bring concept of shame and right and wrong what back about more this, strongly. What about this idea of, that Senator Dole mentioned in the, in the clip of naming names, of shaming names? Is that a good idea? Oh, I think it's an excellent idea. Whether it will be enough, I don't know. You have a large part of the public which is, uh, likes the products that are being put out, the, uh, the debased products that are being put out. And uh, some, some people I know smoke cigarettes, for example. Is, is that, sh should we shame the cigarette manufacturers? Sure, I quit 18, I, I quit 18 days what? ago. So <laughs> Did you quit 18? Yes, so oh. go ahead and shame me. <laughs> All right. Hey, that's really good news. I congratulate you. Yeah. Audiences are picking up on this, too. I think some, some of the movies that, that coming out of the same Hollywood that Dole denounces show that the public is making judgments on some of these things about good and evil, for example. The Scarlet Letter. Uh, came out and they put a dumbed down Hollywood happy ending on Hawthorne's great novel of guilt and repentance and that was a bomb meanwhile movies that really do deal with evil and Satan like Seven or Copycat are hits because people really do kind of want to see these issues played out before them and even see them come to a happy uh, just conclusion well, you know, those kinds of movies always uh, sort of frighten me to death so that I can't see them. But it's <laughs> kind of difficult not to hear the boom boxes with some of the uh, rap lyrics, which uh, some groups have really, and I've been involved in this, have been uh, really taking off after the producers, saying that these are kids, that this kind of, of uh, uh, misogynist talk is not shouldn't be rewarded with contracts and with money and that they ought to be ashamed of themselves for and encouraging this kind and of thing. And it's working. I mean, gangster rap is not the big hit that it sure. was a year ago. I'm, I'm no great authority on this, but I am, I am told that uh, softer kinds of, of groups are, are, are rising up. And I think Dole is right. You, it, you, you have to start 
trying to make people ashamed. It won't happen all at once. Social norms change slowly, but they change faster than, than you think. Now, to be sure, you get the Calvin Klein, who, who, uh, who launched a very cynical ad campaign, and it sold a lot of jeans, uh, I'm afraid. Well, that's because uh, people but complained about the, the, yeah. the campaign, probably. Right, but I think that, the, that, the, that while the jeans may have been sold, that the net effect was to raise people's consciousness about the yeah. terribly trashy kinds of things that we have taken for, come to take for granted in our public right. space. And there needs to be an economic theory which covers this corollary to the Adam Smith's invisible hand, which says that boycotts and public information and, and criticism a la Bennett and Lieberman and so on has a valid role to play in shaping the market. As the professional shame meister, uh, why don't you wrap this up now? <laughs> I, think the, uh, I think the possibility of getting shame back into the society, for example, there should be a stigma on divorce, not just Ill illegitimacy. Uh, I think the possibility of getting shame back as a controlling force in the society is really going to depend upon a religious revival. I don't think, you know, our, our, our morality has been associated with religion throughout our history. And I say this as a rather secularized person, uh, but if you just observe it, I think without a religious revival, uh, we're not going to have... We, we had something called the Great Awakening. When, when was that? We had a couple of them. We had one before the Revolution, one in the 18, early 1800s, as I recall. And there's a th thought that one is going on now with Promise Keepers, Christian Coalition, the Jewish group toward tradition. Uh, and it may be that one is starting now, but I think that would be the best hope. Okay. Our second major idea concerns income stagnation and income inequality. Are the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer? Have wages stopped going up? Liberal economists like uh, Robert Kuttner and Lester Thoreau brought this idea to public prominence. A recent book, The Winner-Take-All Society, put an exclamation point on the idea. Future. Labor Secretary Robert Reich Americans. made the case. Now, for a decade and a half, ordinary families have been working harder and getting less. Puzzled that somehow they have been disinherited from the American dream. Our middle class, as I have noted, and as I noted on Labor Day, has become an anxious class. Jody Allen, uh, the anxious class, the relationship to the winner-take-all society. Well, I'm no doubt, uh, as Reich points out, uh, uh, many Americans are anxious. Uh, we've had uh, three million job layoffs in, in the uh, uh, last seven years, uh, and a new spurt just now. But it's not the anxious Americans that my authors, uh, Robert Frank and Philip Cook, uh, two economists from Cornell and Duke, are, worried, are concerned about. They're, they're concerned about the overly optimistic Amer young Americans who are crowding into what they call winner-take-all segments of the society. Uh, these are not just uh, the traditional sectors of, of arts and entertainment and sports where, where relatively small differences in performance produce enormous differences in compensation. They point out that this phenomenon has spread as a result of mass technology, global communication, to a whole bunch of other areas of the economy, law, medicine, uh, even accounting and sales. We, we have here at least uh, two market-oriented uh, philosophers, uh, Judge Bork and Mr. Pinkerton here, who I s assume one of you would like to take on that notion. Well, I don't understand the, the worry about inequality. I can understand the worry about people who are having trouble getting by, but that is independent of how much somebody else is making. You know, the fact that I don't have a yacht is not due to the fact that somebody else has one. They're not worried about it per se either. They're, they're making a productivity argument, no matter which, which data you, you look at. Uh, some 20 to 40 percent of the people gotten all, all the gains and, and the rest have stagnated or lost income. Now, the, the authors recognize that a certain amount of income inequality is essential to uh, promote investment and productivity. They're not Luddites and, and, and they're, they're not, they're, they are economists. But they say there are diminishing returns here and, the, and they argue sector by sector quite carefully that we have distorted our patterns of, of uh, investment uh, as a result of this winner-take-all economy. I think these guys make an interesting argument, and, and in many ways it, it, it's, it's persuasive. I mean, intuitively, something is going on in, in the world economy where uh, there's a people at the top can sell to a, a global market that's now five billion people, and it, everybody else is left competing with a global market of five million competitors working, making the same manufacturing, so on and so on. So something is clearly happening. I think that the, the better policy prescription still is to focus on how can we improve education and skills training for people at the bottom end so that they can get to high, higher value added jobs 
needed for this. And this is an argument. But, but a, a, everybody can't fill a, a few finite number of superstar jobs by definition. Well, that's right. That's, that's right. right. So, so right. therefore, they, they therefore, they therefore the, 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 I mean, th these guys want to work on the inequality part, which is an interesting argument. I think still the, the, the heart of the argument, though, the, the thing that really grinds the social conscience of Americans is when they see you know, kids coming out of the Newark schools which spend $12,000 a year per kid and have a 7% graduation rate. I mean, the disconnect between the, m the amount of money we spend on public education and job training and the results we get is so enormous that I think the, the most urgent national priority f to deal with the symptoms of inequality is to help people get into the productive workforce. Yeah, but the, the notion yeah. of uh, the inequality uh, has ramifications in other, in other ways. Uh, you're talking about the school system, but a lot of the kids who are not being well educated also are not motivated, and they're not motivated because there's not this middle ground of opportunities that is well publicized, touted, and, and uh, presented to them as uh, career opportunities. I'm not quite sure what it has to do with winner take all, however. Uh, and I, I don't see law as it. Which well, I mean, oh, no, well, actually, well, if, if you have to look at the data, and if you look at them, you'll see that the, that, that the legal profession has become bimodal. The, the average lawyer, in fact, doesn't do very well. But at the top, there are these superstars yeah. making so, enormous right. as a result of class action suits as much right. as look, anything. Look, look, look at, and look they at call for tort reform. So, I mean, they look at it sector by sector. Okay, our third big idea of 1995 goes under the rubric devolution. That is the return of certain powers and functions from the federal government to the states. The idea of reinventing government was boosted by thinkers like David Osborne, Ted Gabler, and James Pinkerton, who is on our panel. The Republican Congress made devolution a key component of its contract with America. Republicans are trying to send federal programs like Medicaid, Medicare, and welfare back to the states. Uh, Jim Pinkerton, tell us uh, what it's all about and where it's going. Well, everywhere you look, markets are crushing politics. Uh, the budget deal is being driven by Wall Street, and this is just a, a reality. Everywhere the, where markets are coming into play, you're seeing more diversity, more decentralization. And our politics in the last decade or so have been a lagging indicator behind this great trend, and it's inevitable that politics will have to catch up and the Republicans in the 104th Congress are beginning that process of devolving power out of the mainframe to the equivalent of 50 PCs across the country. You know, when, when you start talking about devolution and uh, uh, about the, the uh, benefits that you see, and I'm reminded of a, a very old book that may, you may even be too young to remember. It's called The, Fed, uh, the uh, Cities and the Federal System by Roscoe Martin, where the, the whole process by which states lost the ability to manage resources occurred, and that was 60 years ago. And when you look at what's going on now in uh, local governments, there are maybe 10, 12 states that are up to the task that is being assigned to them, and the rest of them are pretty much where they were in the 30s but when the federal government began th taking that, over. So doesn't that presuppose the idea that the federal government is doing a good job, and do you think that? Well, I think that there certainly are many things that have to be improved, clearly. I, no, I don't think anybody in his right mind would argue otherwise. But the fact of the matter is that without preparations like anything else, you cannot just assign a responsibility to someone who's not prepared to carry it out. And in most, in most instances, the states really are not. And they are deceived, too, because they think they're going to get a lot of money. And we know, for example, the state of Texas is going to lose $2 billion. Then money is, is key. I, I think there's also a general mis conception of the public as to who actually runs the programs right now. Almost oh. all of the big social programs are run uh, w with the exception of Social Security, which runs rather well, uh, the rest of them are, in fact, run by states and localities. Now, they run that. Medicaid, they run AFDC, they administer but food I'm stamps. Now, it's true that federal regulations can either improve or impede what they mm -hmm. do, and I think it is that, the j the j on that, the j there is focus. Did they run Medicare? They don't run Medicare, no, because that runs rather well, too. But they right. run Medicaid, right. they run welfare, in they all run, its particulars. They yeah, 93% of the federal programs are funnel, uh, federal social service programs. And they've always run the, the job programs, which have never run very well, either. Uh, well, let's, let's take on, first of all, Social Security and Medicare 
prove the point that the federal government, if left to its own devices for another 10 or 15 years, will bankrupt us all. I mean, you but know, they, they run them pretty well. They may be well, they run them, they they run them pretty well, well except in the bank. So far. I mean, in other words, we have to remember the well, money. But those has aren't to the program managers. Those are your friendly legislators who, who overspend. I mean, yeah. Jody's point is a good one. Given the budgets they are told to manage with, Social Security oh, 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 does a pretty okay. good job. Forgive me, who cares? The issue is I that you've created this uh, giant trust fund in Social Security and Medicare, which of course doesn't exist. It's entirely a notional accounting concept. And the politicians in Washington have felt free to spend actuarially 10 or 20 times what they should be spending on these programs. And now we're looking at you know, the, the, the entitlement programs consuming 100% of the federal budget early in the next century. This is what happens when you centralize. If you create a cookie jar in one place, because this goes back to Plato, the, 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 the eventually the political system will find a way to loot it and we'll all be bankrupt. Judge Bork, also a former, former federal judge, uh, what do you think of this, uh, <laughs> the, the, the federal behemoth? Well, you undermined his <laughs> response. <laughs> <right there. laughs> uh, the, uh, the, the great advantage of devolution, I would think, is to take the regulations off, a lot of the regulations off these programs, and find out whether certain states can know how to do it. And there'll be a lot of experimentation. You get Michigan, Wisconsin, and so forth, which are experimenting already. I mean, uh, welfare reform. Yeah, particularly. and maybe, maybe one or two or three states will come up with programs that are much better than anything the federal government is directing be done now. And if that's true, then all states can, ten, can uh, trend towards those solutions. Jim, w wasn't that true before the great uh, evolution or ascent of power to the federal government? I mean, you had these 50 or at that point, 48, 48. laboratories of democracy, and in theory, some were better than the other, and yet the, uh, as, as Yvonne has pointed out, it was, it was running in such a grungy fashion that we decided to, to move it upward in, well, in, in, the, we based, in the feeding chain. Well, if we base our public policy on wasn't it true, what was true in the days when of radios and vacuum tubes and Model Ts and so on, and, 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 I mean, things have changed so much. I mean, we've learned so much. The, the media is so different. The distribution of power and resources is so different. I mean, it's crazy to keep saying, well, if we devolve power from Washington in 1995, where the federal government is cur currently in the process of bankrupting the nation, it's, it's, it, to say, well, if we give pe people authority to people in Texas or California, they'll immediately wreck everything. I mean, that, that we are really guarding the wrong door of the, the, the fortress. We come now to our fourth and final idea, the dilemma of race. This idea has attracted great scrutiny from many leading American intellectuals, ranging from liberals like Cornell West and Andrew Hacker to conservatives like Charles Murray and Dinesh D'Souza. 1995 was an especially tumultuous year regarding race in America. The O.J. Simpson trial, the Million Man March, Dinesh D'Souza's end of racism, Colin much. Powell for president, almost, they were all headline grabbers, and 1995 marked the first time affirmative action was openly challenged on a national level. Our Constitution guarantees equal justice under law. And as president, by executive order, I will end quotas, preferences, and set-asides. Um, Yvonne Scruggs, what, what happened uh, in, in the racial situation in the United States in 1995? Well, the short answer to that is the American public suddenly realized that race and racism, which had been discounted as a major dynamic in this country, is in fact a major dynamic. You mentioned uh, the O.J. Simpson trial, which I would hope that uh, had hoped you wouldn't mention, but you did. So, and and the res what we're concerned about. I mean, I, I should have mentioned it, shouldn't I have? Well, I mean, played, yeah, played I played just, a lot right. Of, but there, right. it's uh, the the. Uh, difference in, in valence of that and the Million Man March is tremendous and yet both of these events signaled a real recognition of the intractability of racism and the different perceptions that Americans have. Y you are saying that there has been a, a rise in uh, uh, and a rise in the intensity of race consciousness mm. yet at the same time the big policy thrust has been toward color blindness 
in terms of eliminating or diminishing affirmative action. Now, can those mm. two things coexist? Well, there's a problem with the latter because anyone who lives in this country who believes that policy is being implemented or even at this stage in our evolution as a country can be implemented in a colorblind way uh, doesn't understand the world as I see it and seems to me to be living in a world different from the one that I uh, live in. Well, is it, is it appropriate then to be non-colorblind? Is, is to is to pick people for uh, jobs or school on the well, basis of race, gender, or ethnicity. Yeah, but you see, that's to misinterpret what the intention of affirmative action was. I certainly agree that in some, in some case examples, the implementation has gone well beyond what was intended. But the fundamental intention of affirmative action was to level the playing field, to provide access where access has been denied. I think we tend to forget that affirmative action didn't just emerge out of uh, some uh, vacuum. It was in response to clear demonstration that people of color were being unequally treated, had unequal access, and needed to have those things okay. adjusted. I think, uh, I think that's not quite right. I I, I'm sure there was discrimination, but this actually came out of the, the affirmative action, I think actually came out of a government agency which devised a way to get around the law, which said there shall be no dis distinction yeah, I mean, on the basis of race. Yeah, I mean, that's a narrow interpretation. If you forget that the, the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, they were not the fundamental uh, grounding for affirmative action, then I don't know what... No, what no they weren't. I, I don't think so. That, oh. That's why I disagree with you. I think they were a statement of, of non-discrimination. Uh, but affirmative action is an implementation of the fundamental principle that all Americans ought to have equal access to the benefits of this society. Uh, actually, hold on, hold on so a second. Not Hubert, Humphrey, Hubert that. Humphrey stood on the floor of the Senate in 1964 and said, I'll eat the pages of this legislation if anybody tells me that the 1964 Civil Rights Act in, will ever lead to quotas and, and, and categories. And of course it did. Mm -hmm. If we are not a colorblind society and if we have never been a colorblind society, it is all the more Im imperative that we start to become one because we're looking around from Bosnia to Quebec, we're seeing what happens when multiculturalism runs rampant, and it's a catastrophe, and it will be the end of this civilization. Let me just, uh, we are running out of time. Let me go around the room once, starting with uh, Bob Bork, and ask uh, for a final thought as to whether or not you discern a relationship between our four ideas. At least three out of four, I think, relate to a feeling we have that our society is fracturing. It's fracturing along racial lines, it's fracturing to some extent along gender lines, it's fracturing to another extent along this question of income distribution and class warfare, which we hear about, uh, is fracturing along uh, moral lines, uh, about sense of right and wrong. Uh, I think uh, may, maybe devolution fits in there. I'm not sure, but the, I think the other three Fracturing topics. Fracturing between federal and state. Well, that's that's called right. federalism. Right. right, that's called federalism. All right, the uh, the fractured society. Jody, you uh, you have a. Uh, I think the common theme is the importance of social norms uh, and the building of community values, uh, both as they apply to controlling extremism. Uh, in, 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 in the racial context, uh, in, in building support for programs at the local level that actually do meet uh, the community values and, and try to operate in a reasonably efficient fashion, uh, in, in driving out shameful behavior, and also in controlling markets. One of the big themes of the winner-take-all society is what is broken down as a bunch of norms that used to be actually more efficient. Jim? Fifty years ago, an economist who lamentably can never be on Think Tank, uh, the late Joseph Schumpeter, uh, Not my fault he's not a <laughs> he's, he's the late, right? Yeah, okay, go ahead, right. Coined the phrase creative destruction, that capitalism and markets create and destroy at the same time. A and this requires us all to think about some new social covenant contract, whatever, to help us deal with the fact that the economic money wheel is revolving so much faster than it used to. Okay, Yvonne? I see this whole anxiety issue as being maybe at the core of these other arguments. For example, if everyone were not feeling so threatened and insecure, I wonder to what extent, particularly middle class people who are not the winner take all, I wonder to what extent they might, we might as a country be able to uh, integrate each other in uh, an acceptable construct that would not make race an issue, would not make income an issue, would in fact see an opportunity for improving government by involving the local level rather than the federal level, but we're okay. also threatened. Thank you, Yvonne Scruggs, Jody Allen, 
Jim Pinkerton, and Robert Bork, and thank you. Please send your comments and questions to New River Media, 115017 17th Street, Northwest Washington, D.C., 20036. We can also be reached on the World Wide Web at www.thinktank.com or via email at thinktv at aol.com. For Think Tank, I'm Ben Wattenberg. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content.